It's not becoming much of a happy story, is it? Previously on Fall Streak. You don't know her, lady. You don't know her like we do. There's where I fudged up. We're gonna save our game. Alouette thinks it's twinkle twinkle little star. Look at all of them. So the two lyric twins, Callie and Triss. I'm gonna assume this is a Louette. I can't remember which one, which hair color she has. I don't know who he is. The way, step in the alp alphabet song. Alphabet song? No! You're stupid, Diamond. Get out of here. Mom thinks your children are making a mistake. It sounds like Baba -ba Black Sheep. Get out of here, too. Maybe. I thought Mallory was the mom. Mallory not the mom? Without a care in the world, Kelly and Triss watch Lynette fiddle with the device as the argument escalates around them. So this is Lynette then? Lynette... Uh, whatever her name is. It starts with an A, I think. Mallory and Diamond. Alouette. I think I remember that name, Alouette. <laughs> Why don't we ask the original creator? What song did you build the device to auto tune? Auto tune. Why do they name it auto tune? This sounds like auto tune. That's a tough question. I was only thinking of the melody when I made the music box. Sorry, I don't know what song it comes from either. A pensive silence takes hold of the room at Autoon's confession. Nobody knew who was right anymore. Was the tune Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the alphabet song, or Baba Black Sheep? Obviously it's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star! The truth is... Unexpectedly, the one to break that silence was Little Lynette. Everyone's right. It's all the same tune. Is it? No, it's not! Get here. I had to think about that for a moment. No! A wave of commotion spreads through the room at Lynette's claim. Eh? Is that really so? Can you prove it, Lenny? Yeah, just listen. Lynette takes a deep breath and begins to sing. Ba ba black sheep, EFG, how I wonder how you are. No. Oh. Lynette, you're fired. Weaving in lyrics from all three songs, Lynette sings to tune the device without missing a beat. Wow, wow, it's true, Lenny is so amazing. <laughs> I see. Adon nods gravely, his arms crossed on the poison intellectual. Lynette would know best since she loves learning new lyrics and singing so much. What the hell? All of a sudden, though, he stands, rising with such force that tears slams against the ground behind him. That's my little songbird for you! Um... Is he angry or is he excited? Is this what happens when he becomes excited? Shit starts breaking? The veins on his temple begin throbbing like the visceral embodiment of a father's pride. Meanwhile, startled by the sudden loudness, Kelly and Triss dart under my dress as if it were the most natural thing in the world. Don't default to hiding under my dress. I'm wearing pants next time. I'm trying to get back. I've heard that joke enough times already! Oh gods, I remember Lenny and Dee used to do that to me all the time. But mom, it's red. His face is all red. It's comfy down there. <laughs> 
Getting caught up in the atmosphere, the adults end up playing around with the children for pretty much the whole day. Eventually, though, some god decides to take pity on us, and the Repscallions finally grow tired and start dozing off on the carpet. With the kids out of commission, a moment of peace and quiet finally descends upon the house. There's those words again, right? Jeez, you sure have a lot of energy, I don't. I'll turn Fancy's face as he settles back into his seat at the dining room table. Even when playing, one must give their all. Work hard, play harder. Ah, <laughs> your husband knows no chill, Mallory. The children really enjoyed the piggyback rides we gave. Though I bet they would have liked it if Amy pitched in more. Don't talk to me right now. I don't understand how children have so much energy. I think it's really admirable, though I don't. Even though your blood does not run through Alouette, you treat her as your own. She's blessed to have such a wholehearted father. While I appreciate your words, Autoon, you were mistaken about something. It was not Hai who accepted Alouette. When I had nothing left in the world, it was she who accepted me. Ido brings his hand to his chest in heartfelt sincerity. Alouette, Mallory, and Amane. It's because of your strength and compassion that I still draw a breath here and now. And while Alouette may speak oddly and seem dull at times... Yeah. She has the biggest heart of any girl in the world. It is I that am blessed to have such a wonderful daughter. The four of us watch warmly over the children's sleeping visages. Alouette's always been an affectionate girl. All the little ones were huddled up against her as they slept. It seemed her head pads were quite popular. You never know it by how she acts, but the poor child's had it rough at school. Since she speaks so childishly, she often gets teased. Lynette and Dee are good siblings, though. They always stand up for her like little champs. It was somewhat amusing how differently they all slept. While Kelly and Triss' news was spread limbs and open mouths, Lynette and Dia seemed fond of curling into cozy little balls. And there was Alouette, who slept with her arms and wrapped around everyone, as if cradling something precious. There's no mistake. If there's something in life worth protecting, it's this. Have I told you, by the way? We're hoping to get a bigger house for ourselves soon. These children are growing bigger so quickly after all. They'll need the space. Is that why you've been working yourself like a mule? Haha, <laughs> it's been my dream for a while. We've already saved up quite a bit. Is that so? In that case, why don't you contract my place when the time comes? I'll be sure to put lots of love into it. Atun extends a hand with a big smile. Sounds like a plan. Returning the smile, I don't grasp his hand firmly. Let's look forward to the future together, not as two different families, but as one big family. It was a warm sentiment, where both parties dreamed of a bright future. Dripping, overflowing with promise. But it did not come to pass. For some reason, I couldn't bear to look at it. The future they spoke of, it was simply too bright. Too dazzling. Are you negative, Nancy? After a short chat, Mallory and I step outside to take a stroll at her request. Don't the stars look so pretty tonight, Amy? The sky was indeed quite clear tonight, but the starry sky has never been a sight I've found compelling. It was just like the rest of the world, after all. Colorless. Everyone looks at the same sky, don't they? Even if we look the same thing, we see different sights. Pull my gaze back down to Earth. That's right. I haven't forgotten. The promise I made to you. The beautiful sky I see, I want to show it to you. I want to look at the sky together, today, tomorrow, and the day after. I'll make that wish come true. So please, Amy, don't stop looking up. Familiar warmth. Mallory's hand. It takes my chin and lifts my gaze to the heavens. A world full of color. Reflected in Mallory's eyes was a world different from what I saw. One that's always been out of reach. Through living by your side, I'd hoped to make that vision mine. But maybe it's already happened. Maybe color has slowly been seeping into my world ever since that day 15 years ago. Mallory, I... Ah, uh, why do you keep Kitty? Mallory breaks into a jaw above the sun to catch up to a wandering cat we happen across. Ah. No matter how many times I tell you, I assume she won't break this habit. Mallory's feeding the cat kitchen scraps that she always kept on her person for moments like these. <laughs> I remember you used to scold me all the time when I did this back then. Of course. It was hardly plentiful enough to be feeding stray animals. I know. 
It's always just been me satisfying my ego. Even if it helps me for the time being, making an animal dependent on others to survive is self-serving. It's the same as wanting to protect something. It's not noble at all. It's greedy and selfish. I want to protect it. Those words are that the cloak a weakling hides behind to seem strong. You've always been like that. A crybaby who easily gets lonely but tries to be strong. Why is that? It's just... I want the people who smile at me to keep smiling for me. I give pause at Miller's words. I couldn't see what kind of expression she had, but her silent back seemed somehow different from usual. Amy, you remember the garden we used to have back at the orphanage? How we had little parcels of land to care for? The image of a young Miller seeing as she watered the crops revives in my mind at her urging. Remember how you could never make yours blossom? Soil quality, water management, and sun exposure. Though I had meticulously accounted for all these factors, my parcel only met middling success. Living things. More than just need more than just nourishment to live. Oh god. Suddenly the cat recoils and darts off into the night. I was surprised. Molly was uncannily good with animals. For one to flee from her was unheard of. That's what I noticed. Her trembling outstretched hand. The damp ground before her, wet from raindrops of a clear night sky. I don't understand. It's peaceful. So very peaceful. Yet for some reason, that scares me. I'm happy, but I'm scared. I'm satisfied with so little, but at the same time, I want more. I want these peaceful days to keep going on. It's the same for me. These hands of mine are holding it, the soft warmth that is this peacefulness. Yeah, I don't know what to do with it. It was something new to us. In our struggle to survive day to day, we had only been able to look at what was right in front of us. For much of our lives, that was the only thing we knew how to live. That's no longer the case. Human beings are frighteningly adaptable creatures. There are times when we adapt so well it dissociates us, confounds us. It's strange. I can't stop trembling. I watch on as Mallory lowers her head and hugs her knees. I never imagined happiness would feel this fragile. I'm so terrified of losing it, just the mere thought paralyzes me. Well, I suppose we know why the cat ran away, Miss Sunshine. <laughs> Mallory goes silent. Then, without warning, she begins to laugh. Okay, calm down, Mallory. And she's lost it. A mirthful laugh, bleeding away the anxiety. That's the second joke I've heard you make. I never knew how much I needed a wise cracking Amy in my life. Oh, you're so cute. She hops over to me and begins squeezing my cheeks. Shh. Not again. Hey, Amy. What? What's it now? Thanks for cheering me up. Then in close, she kisses me on the cheek. You're not welcome. Are you blushing? I think you're blushing. It's dark, you're imagining things. My dear Amy, it can't be this cute. Shush you. With a spring in her step, the two of us make our way back home. <laughs> As I listen to her hum with a bright smile on her face, I gaze up the sky above. It was a tiny feeling, a little tugging at the corner of my heart. But for a fleeting second, I thought it looked beautiful. I can't see the same world Mallory does. I might never be able to see it. But even then, it's fine. See, Nocturne? It's fine. As long as I have her by my side, she'll see enough color for the both of us. Even the game set is fine. Thank you for coming today, Miss Lurrett. <laughs> I know it'll be a while until Kelly and Tristan leave daycare and formally enter preschool, but there's a lot of logistical things with the new education system that I'd like to get out of the way. It's fine. Tristan's me enjoying himself anyways. The young school teacher looks back into the classroom where Trish was timidly playing with the other children. Did you bring his sister with you, by the way? My husband was supposed to bring her. Knowing him, though, he's probably conveniently lost. He's not very fond of paperwork. Uh -huh, I'm not sure I know anyone who is. I'm sure Kelly is just as cute as Tristan, though. I look forward to teaching them. Wilma's earnest smile makes me falter. I wasn't good at dealing with people that could be so open-hearted with someone they just met. Somehow I understood, though. This one would be fine personally the little ones with. However, when I open my mouth to voice something to that effect, something cuts me off. 
For a split second, the world goes deathly quiet. What is going on? My body lurches off balance as the ground below violently shakes. Instinctively tumbling to the side, I brace myself against the wall as strobes of light and shrill whistling fill the air. The rumbling rattles deep into my bones as I attempt to weather the storm. At what seems like an eternity, it slowly tapers off. Heat. The crackling of flames. Those are the first things I notice when the assault on my senses subsides. Woo, man! That was rough. Think several times, I confirm my vision is still functioning. Ugh, ugh. Into the ground beneath a mountain of flaming debris, as the young school teacher groans. There was something odd about the fire. The way it shifted was nauseating. The children. The smoke and panic voices were leaking from the classroom Triss was in. Shaking off my distant radiation, I grab the door knob and for try to force it open. But it doesn't budge. Even when I step back and throw my entire body weight against it, it makes no headway. The door is too badly dam mangled. Two doors down, storeroom. Crack. A fountain of blood spills from her mouth. There's an axe. The unusual fire had spread onto her legs, but she doesn't even notice the flames etch bizarre patterns onto her exposed flesh. Her spines must have been utterly crushed if she couldn't feel it. Two doors down. Heating instructions, I dash down the hallway and barge into the storeroom. From each of the classrooms I pass, a certain type of voice that splattered in my past was leaking. It was a type of voice I was woefully familiar with. That of human anguish. Clamping down on myself, I kill my thoughts. Right now, Triss's safety was my priority. I didn't need to think about anything else. Snatching an emergency axe up from the corner, I race back to the classroom. Hurry. Even as her own life bleeds away, the trapped woman urges me. Amy is slightly offset of the doorknob, I bring down the axe. The door splits under the impact. I drive my heel into it, causing it to give and separate from its frame at last. Masking my face and my handkerchief, I lower myself into a crawl and into the smoking room. Several small corpses were spread along the floor near the door, having perished from asphyxiation. Triss, where are you? My muffled shout rings out amidst the den of fire. Braving the searing heat, I push deeper into the room even as a lack of oxygen and smoke pressed down on me. A series of barely audible thuds. I pivot to find a little figure lying on the ground. Triss. His leg was trapped under a wooden beam. Rushing over to my position of the neck. He sits in the neck of the axe, which needs to breathe and pray it so he can pull free. When he tries to stand, I immediately press the handkerchief to his face and push him low to the ground as I laid him out. Him getting stuck was a stroke of luck. His peers had likely suffocated trying to escape in the smoke, while his entrapment forced him to stay immobilized and low to the ground. Though he was limping slightly, it was minor compared to how he could have ended up. Upon exiting the classroom, I find an injured schoolteacher looking up at me. Her eyes focused weakly on me, but it seemed like she had the strength to say anything. Down the hallway, the sound of crashing rings out as the burning ceiling begins to collapse. There was no time. She couldn't be saved. The old me would have left her behind without batting an eyelid. But maybe something had changed in me over the years. You've done enough. Kneeling before, I gently ease her eyes shut. Rest now. A faint smile graces her features as tears squeeze out from beneath her eyelids. The least I could do was end her suffering. Okay. Well. Without looking back, I race down the hall with Tristan one arm and axe in the other. I fly down the stairs only to find the door to the first floor shut. Rather than reach for the doorknob though, I press the back of my hand against the wood. Hot. I instinctively jerk away. This was always- this way was not good. Doubling back, I had a window on the staircase. It was a fair distance off the ground, but it would have to do. Using the knob of the axe to clear away the glass, I wedge the blade into the wood. Then I grab the handle and lean outside. As I do, the head hooks onto the window frame, acting as a full crown that swings me back towards the wall. Holding Triss close, I stretch down as far as I can before letting go. Though the maneuver shapes off some of the fall, the force of the drop still causes me to sink to my knees. What is this? It's pretty, that's what it is. When I look up, an unbelievable sight greets me. It was midday, the entire sky darkened over. An unending din of screams and groans filled the air as patches of the unusual fire sweep through town. What's going on? What was this fire that suddenly descended from the sky? There are questions that would have to wait. 
Leaving Tris to a spot of relative safety, I kneeled down and examined his body. His skin was marred and soot, but he didn't appear to be burned anywhere. He had been lucky to escape and save, scathed, Triss. While his body was fine, there was still cause for concern. No answer. No response. Finally, he stares off in the space as tears roll down his face. It'll be alright, Triss. I wipe the tears and ash away from my handkerchief before procuring a sash for my person. Using it to tie Triss to my back, I stand and set off for home. Along the way, I see many things. A man cursing as he tossed bucket after bucket onto a blazing house. A child crying out for help, unheard by the mark that limped aimlessly through the streets. A fire that cannot be extinguished, a fire that cannot be slowed. At some point, it even begins to rain. But the downpour does nothing to st stimmy the flames advance. A world turned upside down. A people ravaged by calamity. It was something I did not want to show Triss, something I did not wish for him to see. Triss. Though the rain falling from over is cold, every now and then I can feel it. A faintly warm raindrop hitting the back of my neck. It's called tears. When we made it back home, our finer house untouched by fire. Kellia? Atune? No answer comes. They didn't seem to be home. Though their safety was a concern, searching for them blindly won't accomplish anything. Staying put was the best course of action. Placing a pot under the faucet, I began stockpiling water. While the plumbing still seemed functional for now, there's no guarantee that it continued to be the case. Just as I begin and taking inventory, the sound of the door being knocked open erupts from the front of the house. I should have recognized who they were immediately, but their appearance was somehow wrong. Toon? I rushed to his side as he collapsed to the ground and the moving Kelly had cradled in his arms. His hands were blackened with strange marks from a mysterious flame, while Kelly's hands... I... I... We're simply no longer there. Searing heat. Roaring fire. I forced my eyes open. At some point my surroundings had transformed. A shattered town crumbling to the ground all around me. Was this... Sokotrain? Under a burning sky, a rainbow-colored fire was ravaging the world. Panic seizes my heart as the fire swells, spreading its burning tendrils through the area. Daddy. Daddy! A familiar voice calls out. Elia? She had taken, fallen a short distance away. A giant mass of burning wood and stone was pinning her arms down. Kalia. Horrified, I dash over to her. Uh, Daddy. Her face contorts in tear-stained agony. It hurts. Hold on, Kalia. In a panic frenzy, I grab the mass, pinning her down. This thing sound pierces the ears, my flesh bubbles from touching the rainbow flames. Gah! Kelly screams as the twisted mass shifts weight over her pinned arms. It hurts! It hurts! I push until I can no longer feel my arms. It doesn't budge an inch. Damn it! Tormented by Kelly's cries, I howl in frustration. Before long, my cinched arms fall limply to my sides. I drop to my knees. Is he gonna, like, rip her arms off to get her out? As he headed from the smoke, Kelly's feeble voice barely registers my murky consciousness. At this rate, Kelly was going to die. No. I won't accept a fate like that. Pulling myself together, I scan my surroundings. My eyes dart along the ground, locking onto a suitable object, a blackened shard of metal with a saw-like edge. I feel my insanity leave me as I grab it with trembling hands and lift it over Kelly's trapped arms. Yep, he's gonna saw them off. Her heart-wrenching cries fill the air as I press the metal's jagged edge into her arm. If I don't stop. How I am crying like a demon possessed, I saw vigorously, feeding vivid red to the roaring fire. Before long, I hit bone. We didn't have time to saw through it. Uh, pouring strength into my frame, I grab what remains of her arm. I twist and whip up. With a sickening snap, the bone breaks. Heat of encroaching flames, the sound of collapsing buildings. Driven by those menacing sensations, I hastily start cutting into her other arm. Kalia had stopped screaming at some point. She was probably dead. I could tell from her faint, ragged breathing and weakly shut eyes that she was at her limit, though. We were out of time. Praying it was enough, I grabbed Kelly with both arms. Then, planting my feet, I grip my teeth and pull with all my might. 
The grotesque sound of meat tearing culminates with a gut-wrenching pop as Kelly's joints give and she separates from her trapped lower arms. Stumbling backwards, I pivot and take off with her in tow, weaving through the burning wreckages that block our path. I don't know if it's fine anymore, Doctor. I don't think it's fine. Time and space seem to splur as I run, but eventually we make it to a safe location. Ah. Gasping for breath, I lower Kelly's limp figure to the ground and examine her arm stumps. It seemed the fire had cauterized most of her injury. They left strangely patterned burn marks in the process, though. Hmm. In an attempt to fashion makeshift bandages, I try and tear several stretches of fabric from my shirt, only to discover that my fingers are too damaged to perform the movements. My hands were covered in strange patterns as well. Kalia. As the tension leaks from my body, the pain begins to resurface. I lift my head to look at Sokotrain's burning sky. That's when I notice. All around me, screams and groans are filling the air, creating a din of unending despair. Why? Why is this happening? I can't... feel the rain. With great difficulty, I manage to bend my fingers back. But though I can clearly see the falling rain hitting my hand, I couldn't feel a thing. Would you be able to carry someone if you can't feel your hands? I feel like you wouldn't be able to. Ugh. One day had passed since I patched up Kelly and Atun. Between Kelly's amputated arms and severe burns on Atun's hands, it wasn't difficult to deduce what happened. At my side, Triss peeks over to where Kelly is resting. He looks back and forth between Kelly's absent arms and his own intact ones. I wouldn't want to, that's for sure. Yeah. A bead of sweat rolls down Atun's face as he writhes in pain. It's spreading again. A bizarre phenomenon plays out before me. Without warning, the marked areas on Atun's hands begin to glow. When the light subsides, I observe that the burn patterns have crept up his arms. The same thing was happening to Kelly's burns as well. It seemed the wounds inflicted by the usual fire were harmful even after their initial infliction. It was like a disease, or a curse. I had to find a way to retreat it before it did any more damage. Watch over and Daddy and Kelly at Triss. Food, water, and medical supplies had already been set down in arms reach of bed. Don't leave. Don't let anyone in. Retreating into my room, I make preparations and set off. A locked drawer. For years, I'd only ever touch it to maintain its contents. My heart beats not. After suspecting them one by one, I tighten a holster throwing knives around my leg. As I do, my eyes stretch over to the proof of my existence, a razor-sharp butcher knife that curved to a tapered point. Breath does not come from my mouth. The scratches and chips that marred it were proof that I succeeded in carving a path to this day. Even after all these years, it still felt natural in my hand, as if it were but an extension of my body. My feet do not tread upon this earth, for I am colorless. The weight of steel was one of the absolute truths in my life. Sincere and free lives, it was that quality of purity that enabled it to spill blood with ease. The past was never something I could escape, was it? Concealing the knife on my person, I lock the door behind me as I leave. And never came back. In contrast to yesterday's chaos, a somber silence had laid claim to the hazy morning air. The situation had changed since yesterday. At some point, the inextinguishable fire dissipated all at once, ending just as abruptly as it had begun. Only the smoldering remains it left behind could be seen now. I'll check up on Mallory first. Though it takes longer than usual to get to the Bussia household of the debris, I arrive without complication. While their house appeared to be untouched, many of their neighbors had been less fortunate. Find Mallory in the streets kneeling over a victim she seemed to have pulled from the rubble. Mallory. Though I call out to her, she doesn't respond. It's only when I place a hand on her shoulder that she turns to face me. I wonder... I bet her two other kids died. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and if you enjoyed it, leave a like and hit the sub for more walkthroughs, playthroughs, and let's plays on the gaming experience.